You're about to see clips of a few places in downtown Phoenix. I want you to imagine being there, walking through these places. Imagine the temperature on your skin, the smell of the air. Begin to sense these places. I now want to tell you a story. The story of this woman, Winnie Ruth Judd, and a story of a murder. Winnie was born to a preacher family in Indiana. She eventually married a doctor, Mr. William C. Judd, hoping to live a big city life and start a family. This dream crashed, however, when Dr. Judd became addicted to morphine and failed to hold a job, forcing them to travel throughout the Southwest and Mexico looking for work. One of those stops was the bustling small town of Phoenix in the 1930s. Ruth settled here in this home on West Linwood Street and got a job as a nanny to the wealthy Ford family. So by the time Dr. Judd had lost his job and was getting ready to move again, she felt attached to this place. She didn't want to leave, so she decided to stay and support herself. It was in this house that Ruth first anchored herself into the Phoenix community. One night, while she was sitting on the porch, looking at the stars, a tall, handsome man who lived next door came out to have a smoke. His name was Jack Halloran. Jack, a popular, wealthy, and married businessman, was known to enjoy a good time and to sleep around. He earned himself a nickname, Happy Jack, because of this. And that night, on the porch, he hit it off with the lonely woman next door. One night of talking became many. And on Christmas Eve, 1930, their affair began. Although Jack only saw the relationship as a side fling, Ruth fell madly in love with him. Soon, Jack introduced Ruth to his other party girls, whom he was also sleeping with, Agnes Ann Leroy and Hedvig Sammy Samuelson. The three became fast friends, and soon moved into this bungalow on 2nd Street together, which was heavily funded by Jack. The parties and fun continued through the months, with Jack bringing clients over to the girls for a drink and a good time. All three women were sleeping with Jack, and an intense jealousy developed between them. Later in the year, Anne and Ruth got jobs working at the Grinnell Clinic just a trolley ride away. It was here at this clinic that Ruth typed up medical reports of patients' prescriptions. One day, she befriended a patient named Lucille Moore. While typing up her prescription, she noticed a drug to help treat syphilis. Also on that day, Ruth introduced Lucille to Jack, hoping she might come to the next party on 2nd Street. Later that night at the 2nd Street house, Ruth, Sammy, and Anne were getting ready for bed when the two girls asked Ruth if she had introduced Lucille to Jack, knowing Lucille had syphilis. Yes, she said. What, they screamed? She could destroy Jack's career, which would kick us out of this house, which would ruin our lives. Anne and Sammy threatened to tell Jack what Ruth had done. 
Ruth, enraged at such a threat, retaliated by saying that she would tell everyone at the clinic Anne and Sammy were lovers, destroying their social lives and career as well. Sammy, beside herself, rushed back into the room with Ruth's pistol. I will shoot you if you say that. A fight ensued. Sammy and Ruth wrestled over the gun, while Anne beat Ruth over the head with an ironing board and suddenly... Ruth had shot both Anne and Sammy through the head. Winnie Ruth Judd had just murdered her two best friends in this house. In a panic, Winnie called her lifeline, Jack, to help clean up the mess. He stumbled into the house drunk, and afraid his happy party house might be discovered, he said, You're going to take them to L.A. I have people who can take care of this there. He went to the garage and got two large steamer trunks. He folded Anne's body into one of them, but Sammy couldn't fit in the other. Jack had an idea. He called his friend Dr. Brown to the home. It was Dr. Brown's job to make Sammy fit, and he sure made her fit. In this small home on 2nd Street, Dr. Brown sliced Sammy's body into pieces, hacking and packing her limbs into a series of smaller trunks. By the next morning, the bodies were packed and the house was clean of evidence. Jack told Ruth, get on the next train to LA with these trunks and there will be someone to meet you there. Ruth, traumatized and shaken, agreed. Her brother, last she had heard, lived out in LA too and he could maybe help her. The next day she came here, the Phoenix Union train station. It was here where she waited with the trunks. It was reported the trunks were seeping with fluid, dripping blood onto the ground. It was here that these trunks and Winnie Ruth Judd rode into history. Ruth and the trunks got on the train and actually made it to LA. The trunks, however, were stopped for inspection due to their stench and soaking texture. Ruth fled the scene without them. Soon, the Los Angeles police had confiscated them and the investigation to find her was on. A nationwide manhunt to find the trunk murderess. The tiger woman was on. Ruth hid out for six days, but eventually turned herself in at a funeral home in L.A., where she was promptly brought back here to Phoenix. It was here, on the top floors of the Maricopa County Court Building, where Ruth was imprisoned and tried. In the courtrooms in this building, the bloody details of her murder were shown to the world, with national sensationalism only in comparison with the O.J. Simpson murders. Hundreds of reporters and bystanders stood outside the building to catch a word of the blonde butcher's antics. Winnie Ruth Judd was eventually found guilty of first-degree murder, but on count of insanity, she was sent to the Arizona State Hospital and spent a majority of her life there until her death in 1998. There is much more to Ruth's story. The trial and her multiple, and I emphasize the word multiple, escapes from the mental hospital, but it's outside the focus of this video. Knowing this story, I'm going to play the exact same clips as before. Here we go. What did you feel? What did you imagine? In Derek McCormick's piece, Remotely Sensing Effective Afterlifes, you have just gone through the process of deciphering the story of place. 
learning the story, quote, opens the possibility of touching the afterlives of Ruth and her friends. When you imagine the stories that happened in these places, you are, quote, materializing the absence through the present objects you see, ergo the houses and sidewalks. You know something is missing, that there is something more, an excess energy to these objects and places, and the story helps you, quote, align them into place. Now this imagination is great, it's clean, it's easy to do, if you know the facts. But what if the story, the story I just told you, was wrong? Let's start at the Second Street House again. At the time of the parties and fun, Ruth is falling deeper and deeper in love with Jack. She is doing this all while Anne and Sammy are sleeping with him. This confuses and enrages her. Every move they make with him, every touch on the shoulder, every flirtatious giggle, every kiss on the cheek, Ruth takes that as a taunt. She is married. She knows she can't compete with Anne and Sammy for Jack's love. The stress becomes too much to bear, and she begins taking the prescription barbiturate Luminol to calm her nerves. But with her loss of reason, the thoughts and anger towards her flatmates only spiral more and more out of control. The night of the murder did not begin with a fight. It began with a flirt. That night, Jack was over at the Second Street home for bridge and a drink. Anne, in a flirtatious mood, came into the kitchen where Ruth and Jack were talking. Anne wrapped herself around him and kissed his cheek right in front of Ruth. This was the last straw. Later that night, Anne and Sammy are peacefully sleeping in the bedroom, but this time, Ruth wasn't with them. She is sitting on the couch, clutching a pistol in her hand and rocking back and forth. The barbiturates and jealous thoughts had overrun her. She was going to kill them, and she was going to kill them tonight. Sammy gets up and goes to the bathroom while Ruth slides into the bedroom, puts the pistol to Anne's sleeping head, and pulls the trigger. Sammy, convinced something had fallen in the bedroom, goes back into the room and meets the same fate. Ruth, in a drug-induced panic, decides the only place she is safe is with her brother in L.A. He would know what to do with the bodies. He would save her. However, there was one problem. She didn't have two large trunks. This led her, and her alone, on the fateful night to cut up Sammy's body, inch by inch, using just kitchen knives, a leg off here, a torso slice there, and it was her alone who put them in trunks. The next morning, she was at the very same train station enacting her plan, and she again rode her way into history. Now, both of these stories could be true. Ruth herself testified in court multiple times telling the first story. Here is her explaining this version of the story in her later years. We were all in our pajamas. I went to put this down on the sink, and... Uh, Sammy came at me with a gun. She came through the, the breakfast room door. With, no, with any warning whatsoever? Did she say anything? Oh, yes. We quarreled violently over what I was going to tell on them and what they would tell my husband about me and so forth, that I had gone out with John Doe. So they, the fight took place in the breakfast room door, and that is the only way. This would seem like a closed case from this evidence. But what is even more fascinating is that she told the second story as well. A confession letter written by Ruth was uncovered in 2014 in the archives of one of her defense attorneys. It tells the story of her cold-blooded, premeditated murder. Because of these conflicting stories, what took place in this house on 2nd Street has raised more questions than answers. Because of this, historians and journalists almost 90 years to the day have fought over what actually happened. I want you to experience the clips one more time.
What did you experience? Did you feel an unease, a mysterious haze over the places? Were the visions of what happened blurry? Did they even fade away? The stories of these places and our experiences of them have just become atmospheric. The potential spectral afterlives appear so clearly like a lightning strike one second, only to blur into a clouded mud of mystery the next. The story of Winnie Ruth Judd, with all of its twists, turns, and questions, becomes atmospheric. Each place becomes an artifact, an atmosphere, an object filled with the potential effective energies of her story. And this video was our chance to sense it.